want to welcome everyone back to the Pete Quinone Show. I am here again with Thomas777, but we have something a little different, a little diversion planned for today. How are you doing, Thomas? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for hosting me again, as always. Yeah. Well, I had contacted you and said, um, instead of Cold War Part 6 with the holidays coming up, let's pick that up after after the holidays are over. But... There was a book that I read a few years ago um, when I found out how how many people at the time, influential people, people who became leaders were inspired by it, Reflections on Violence by Sorel. And then I found out that the Imperium Press version had a forward by you. Indeed. So um, I decided to have you on and let's discuss it. I think that um, this can go in a lot of different directions. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, man, definitely. When did Sorel come on your radar? Like, when did you read him first? You know, it's interesting because a lot of people, a lot of people associate Sorel, like, Ebola, um, and some of these other thinkers with, with kind of the rise of, like, you know, a, a kind of right-wing subculture on the internet. I came to Sorel before that. I'm not trying to sound like some, like, original, like, or some, like, OG who's like, oh, I knew about Sorel before, but... And um, the stuff that the National Alliance would put out and the Institute for Historical Review, that stuff was pretty weighty, man. You know, like William Pierce, um, whatever, whatever anybody thinks of him or thinks of that whole scene, you know, he was he was an, he was a serious intellectual. You know, he, he read tons of stuff, um, some some of which I, I didn't really connect with. You know, he was a big Will, William Galley Simpson guy and he was a big kind of, you know, he, he spent a lot of time with, you know, a lot of this kind of like social Darwinist stuff that, you um, I, I don't put a lot of stock in, but uh, he'd reference George Sorrell, okay, like on some of his ADV broadcasts um, in more than a passing capacity. And the IHR and guys like um, H.K. Thompson and Keith Stimley and, and and the like, like they, they'd raise Sorrell all the time. And they considered him to be like a serious thinker. And one of the reasons why is because part of their whole – part of their whole mandate because the IHR, I mean, they're, they're still putting out great content that's very, very relevant. They made the transition to to um, the information age very seamlessly. But during the Cold War, um, you know, during the early Reagan era was kind of when, when they launched and became really um, active. So obviously, like they were constantly kind of defending the revisionist perspective against allegations like, oh, well, you know, the, the Second World War, among other things, it you know, it was a fight against these like socialist uh, conceits and 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 the brutalities that derived therein. And you know, the Third Reich—it it was just another socialist government. And we all know socialism is this godless thing that you know doesn't have any legs to stand on. And why would anybody on the right, you know, pay it any mind? Um, and Sorel, <clears throat> the the answer to that is because of thinkers like Sorel. And even if you've got no interest in kind of the different iterations of socialism and the revolutionary imperatives that you know kind of became the 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 animating mythologies of these of these interwar of the of these early 20th century and then later interwar ideologies um even if you even if you don't put a lot of stock in that like you get so if you want to understand if you want to understand european politics after nine after 1789 you, you've got to be in dialogue with socialism I and mean, you got to understand you know what how how the how the right how the revolutionary right was dealing with those realities you know um and Sorrell was kind of first among those thinkers. And if uh, I basically accept Ernst Nolte's paradigm that uh, um, the uh, that, that 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 Italian fascism and, and things like the Falange Party in in Spain, they were reacting. They were reaction against you know kind of the monarchist right and like the reactionary right as much as they were a reaction against Marxist Leninism. And then National Socialism was a uh, was a reaction to that in in dialectical terms, like. Uh, you know, some premises that were hostile and some that were not. But that's the way to understand George Sorrell. And in America, when people think of the right, you know, they think of, uh, they, they think of, uh, they, th they think of Jeffersonians who, uh, you know, like, like John C. Calhoun, or they think of like America first guys in the 21st century, you know, and like the, the Taft Republicans who were, you know, who were anti-New Deal and anti-interventionist. And, and both of those guys, I mean, even the latter, obviously, they were kind of traditional Hamiltonian nationalists. But, you know, their whole idea is, you know, like, get the government off your back, you know, uh, um, you know, and, uh, and, and, and decentralize authority and, 
you know, they kind of hustle on the on their own terms to to the kind of class identities that um, most kind of European paradigms suggest are are what informs political reality. But Sorel wasn't a class warrior, and like we'll get into that. You know, like his Sorel's his he his kind of he he was oh you know like Nietzsche did before he viewed Sorel viewed culture as like peaking early. You know, like the pre-Socratic era. era. You know, like the pre-Peloponnesian War era of Doric Athens. That's what Sorel. That's what Sorel thought was like the zenith of like human culture and political organization. Like it wasn't some guy who was saying like, "Oh, we just got to give." And he wasn't even. He wasn't even like. He wasn't even like the uh, the Stefan George circle or like Ernst Younger. He wasn't even saying like, "Oh, we just we just got to inundate you know the working class with some kind of like patriotic or like racialized identity." He wasn't saying that at all. He was saying that you know there's a way. There's a way to insinuate into revolutionary consciousness among the workers, like something that's like culturally elevated, you know, and that, that will change things and, you know, educate people in a way that, you know, is progressive, not progressive with a capital P, but, you know, is is progressive in terms of, you know, uh, allowing them to conceptualize themselves and, and conceptualize, you know, political action in, in ways outside of this like narrow like paradigm of like, you know, hostility to capital and you know, control of one's labor and, you know, like material justice in terms of, you know, getting paid for one's labor. Like he viewed that as kind of banal, you know, not like that's not important. Obviously it's important, but that can't be the end all purpose of your political activity. And it certainly doesn't rationalize, you know, like, like murdering your own countrymen wholesale. I mean, if that's what it comes down to, because that's, you know, what the proverbial gods ordain. Okay. I mean, you've got to deal with that in a manly and serious way. In a stoic way, but that's not something you pine for just because, uh, you know, it's it, it's like, well, you know, God is dead. So we just got to find some kind of catalyst, you know, for violence that, that can be rationalized in, in, in the language of the day. Like he wasn't saying that at all. But, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this, because this is I mean, I, I've even written a little bit on this recently. It's the oh, great. the socialist right. When you say, well, the National Socialists were on the right, people lose their minds. I mean, uh, mind you, these are the same people who use the term capitalism and don't realize where the, you know, they know where the term came from. So they're like, well, we're just taking that term for ourselves. And I think what they would say is the difference between the left and the right is egalitarianism. The left is egalitarian. So was the socialist right egalitarian? Not in the sense of like like not not in not in a biological sense and uh not in not in the way that um like not 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 in the way that in, in contemporary discourse people think of it. And I'll qualify it too. Even a lot of people a lot of people who should know better misunderstand too what Marxian equality was. You know, the whole, like the secular humanists, they've taken, you know, the idea of, quote, human dignity and kind of extrapolated all kinds of strange things out of it. But Marx, uh, I've got nothing nice to say about Marx and Lenin. When Marx was talking about, quote, equality, he was talking about a kind of equal dignity across the class divide and across, you know, kind of the, the, like the, you know, and, 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 eliminating, and eliminating these kind of contrived um, distinctions between people based on rank. You know, and uh, you know this, uh, and 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 from there, you know, like affording um, a kind of elevated dignity to the workers, whom you know, in his estimation, um, were were the were, were the ones responsible for generating the wealth of the nation. Okay, he wasn't saying like, oh, men and women are exactly the same, or like there's no differences in intelligence between men. Like that's a weird kind of cope that. Uh, that 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 like post nineteen forty five cope that you know people wanted to kind of maintain who, people who were not going to attack the capitalist system on structural terms you know that was kind of like what they'd invoke in order to say like no actually like we're 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 more morally sound than than you know than than the Marxists and in in the Soviet Union and their satellite states so that's important to keep in mind but the uh, the idea of socialism. You know, it didn't originate with Marx, and that was that was one of Spangler's important points. Like, even if you don't accept Spangler's view of history, and you think it's like you know just kind of needlessly esoteric and mystical, um, his uh, his essay, his essay, Prussian Prussianism and Socialism, 
And then later, to a lesser degree, his book. I mean, it's yeah, it's, it's like a longer essay that it's, it's been turned, it's been beefed up with like secondary um, analyses. Um, but uh, the hour of decision, like basically the modern state as we know it, um, in structural terms, like owes to the Prussian state. Okay, everything from the military draft, you know, to public education, you know, to having like pensions for for retired people, uh, like that that came from the Prussians. Okay, and I mean. Even that that's literally why in America too, like early education is kindergarten. Okay, like it's not an accident. Okay, I mean, so that's um and there's a something that used to be openly acknowledged. Like it's not so much anymore. I mean, some of that's political, some of that's just because people are kind of ignorant. But um, you know, it's not like it's not like when Marx and Engels put their proverbial ink to paper. It's not like they it's it's not like they it's not like Europe was, you know, like this feudal society or some or some kind of Jeffersonian Yeoman society, like the Confederate States. And they were like, you know what? We need to like beef up a government that can, you know, provide equity, you know, to people based on their labor and can like look after like old folks. What they were doing was they were taking something that already existed in places like Prussia and to a lesser degree, you know, in places like France um, and the Habsburg Empire and saying like, okay, we, we've got to like improve upon this and make it into a progressive instrumentality to advance history. So this that's important to keep in mind too like if, if you were a european writing you know in, in the in the in the 1900s like sorel like you were looking backwards at you know your political heritage going back about three centuries you were just looking at marx and saying oh i see marx's idea i can improve upon that and make it acceptable to the right so that's important to keep in mind and um you know kind of the kind of the first truly socialist institution is is the modern military like uh, it is okay like it's not the military is a lot of things what it's not is it's not some robustly capitalist thing okay i mean it's and the the prussians arguably this was their strength and their weakness um prussia really is a wasteland there's like nothing there okay i mean you can like farm dirt and rocks um and uh you you've got you, you've got port access but i mean other than that it's and you're surrounded by hostile Okay, and I mean, and obviously, like Prussia was Prussia was the the Germans weren't the original occupants of Prussia. Okay, there was there was there was there was a barbarian element there, like a true like pagan barbarian element of indigenous Slavs that they ethnically cleansed. Um, not because the Germans are bad guys. I mean, ethnic cleansing is was just wasn't is just the way it thinks, especially in that part of the world. But the kind of key institution of the Prussian state was the Prussian army. Um, that's what made it possible. It was literally like this garrison state, okay? Um, and so from that, that's what they extrapolated, kind of like their model of what of what, of what, what society should look like and how it should be organized. Like, it's very much at odds with, like, the Anglo-American sensibility. But, um, yeah, that's a lot of things. You can say that it's authoritarian. You can say that it doesn't respect people's freedom or individual liberty. You can say that in some way it stunts, like, creativity. And maybe it does. I don't see it that way, but... I also don't hold it out as like the zenith of human political development. But one thing it's not is at all like left wing or 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 liberal. I mean, it's it's the opposite in extreme terms. You know, I mean, because, yeah, uh, like a military type structure, if that's your model, like, yeah, there's some kind of basic there, there, there's there's some kind of basic cohesion and respect for like the various ranks. But it's it's singularly obsessed with rank. You know, it's it's the ultimate hierarchy. It has no conceit that like, oh, we're all equals here. You know, it uh, it's very in fact it it it, it very much repudiates that. So that's something important to keep in mind, and that that's basically what Sorel was getting at. Um, you know, it is uh like what he was calling for is um, you know, uh, a, a socialism that you know makes meaningful cultural activity possible, and that reflects you know basic human nature in some way that's not totally at odds with reality but again too he was like he looked at that as like as a means of an end because again like his model he's not saying like oh the kaiser reich is so great or you know frederick ii's prussia is so great like what he was saying was that you know things went wrong when uh things went wrong when, when men like socrates became powerful in ancient athens you know like his his ideal was the the pre-socratic uh um um you know, Peloponnesus. So the socialist right, when they're coming to power, are they, 
is there a rebellion against establishment liberalism or is there a rebellion against est- what is growing communism at the time? I mean, it was both, but it depended on where you were at. If we're going to use Weimar as kind of the, I mean, obviously, like, Swell was writing in the pre-Weimar era. Um, and, and the situation in France is more complicated. But uh, if you're talking about the real, like, if, you, if you're talking about the true kind of divide dialectically and, and socially as well as politically, and in terms of armed conflict, obviously, you know, it came down to, like, actual civil war. The place like Munich. There was a couple different things going on um, in the Weimar years. You had uh, you you had organizations like the Stahlhelm, you know, they were basically you know Kaiserreich veterans who wanted to turn things back to the way they were. Um, but they and you know and they 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 were fighting the case. They, they were the guys who constituted the early Free Corps. But then you had guys you had guys like Ernst Rahm and Joseph Goebbels who basically saw the communists as essentially correct in their methods. That they were just you know wrong in their in their ideological conceits. You know, Goebbels would go as far as he'd, he'd organize street protests with the KPD, you know, to bring to to, to bring down um, the uh, the unions that were, like, friendly to the Social Democrats. You know, and uh, and this made a lot of people upset. And Goebbels was the one kind of Strasser faction, National Socialist inner party man who survived the night of June, um, uh, of, of June 1934. You know, um... So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I think what really, like, I, I think National Socialism, like, ossified into what it truly was. When, when Hindenburg told Hitler that Ernst Rahm and all of his fellows and, and Strasser had to die, and then Hitler gave the order, and then Himmler and Sepp Dietrich and the rest of them not just carried it out, but they also murdered guys like Kurt von Sch- uh, Schleicher. I mean, that, that was, that's kind of like what turned National Socialism into, like, a... A pretty conventional right wing tendency, honestly. Like I, uh, not not in the sense of you know not 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 right wing in terms of like Donald Trump or not even right wing in terms of like Robert Taft, but by European standards, um, the Third Reich was more conventionally right wing than people will acknowledge. I mean, they because there's there's moronic stuff like like Jonah Goldberg saying like oh fascists are a bunch of like Hillary Clinton liberals or something like, but it. But there's serious people too who aren't prone to that kind of moronic stuff, who don't like really understand because they, you know, they they read these like dispatches from uh um from from Dietrich Eckert and and from Ernst Rahm like saying like yeah God is dead you know like the hell with the capitalists and the Jews like burn everything down you know we're gonna we're 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 gonna march on everything and we're gonna kill everybody and we're gonna build this like new society of the barracks like that. I mean, those, don't get me wrong. Those guys were serious about that. That wasn't that wasn't just like so much talk, and and, and a lot of them were frankly psychopaths. But they they um that 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 came to an end in June 1934. And if if you're if you're killing people because a man like Hindenburg is telling you that like you know these men are these men are red revolutionary rabble who have to be stopped, like you're a lot of things, but you're not left wing. Okay, when you're executing that order. So that, I mean, that's my opinion. I know some people disagree, but I. I've been studying the topic for a lot of years. I think I have some insight into it. Let's talk a little bit about what you you said about Europe and how Europe defined things differently than here. Um, when socialism or communism is mentioned here, it almost seems like we just have this, we know exactly what's being said. But from a European standpoint, especially at that time, when socialism was spoken of or communism was spoken of, how did the European culture make it a different interpretation? Even when you read Yaki, you know, Yaki, when he's talking about, um, when he's talking about Europe, it's a different language than the language that we're used to reading in the books that, you know, were basically written by the victors. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Well, it's also too. It goes back to it goes back to sociological origins. You know, I mean, America and some, depending on where you fall on it ethically, but also just depending on what kind of weight you put on the different variables. You know, America is something of an incomplete society. I mean, that's either good or bad. But you know, um, everything that Europe was trying to do in the modern era, okay, and it's, it's reached its zenith in the twentieth century. 
we were trying to repair the social fabric in some ethical way that had been smashed after the after the Middle Ages. Okay, in the Middle Ages, there was this basic interdependence between everybody. You know, uh, the lords were dependent upon the serfs. Both were dependent upon the king, and the intermediary between the two of them was the clergy. You know, these people couldn't survive without each other. Like that cannot be overstated. You know, this idea that if you were like a lord of the manor, you know, you could just act like the the character in that silly Mad Max movie who's like, you know, forcing people to worship him from water or something. Like that's not that's not the way things were. Like I'm not saying if you were a medieval serf, I'm not saying you had some great life, and I'm not saying you had some I'm not saying you had adequate remedies if if you had a cruel master, but he needed you. You know, he could not defend the land without you. He could not kill the land without you. He had nothing if 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 you were not willing to work. But in contrast, like you had you had no access to justice and you had you had no nobody to advocate for you with 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 royal authority, like if he did not exist. I mean you had the church too, but that was the the church weren't men who worked. They did very important things, but they, they, they operate in a totally different world. I mean, so it's you you didn't have a direct line to authority unless, you know, you had a rapport with the Lord of the Manor. So that's fundamentally important. What changed in the modern age and reached kind of its critical and um in, in every sense, you know, and it like in existential terms and in several terms, it reached its kind of critical um state in the twentieth century. You know, people were ripped off the land. They were thrown into factories that literally employed tens of thousands of people in these dangerous conditions where you were insinuated into some machine, you know, for hours and hours a day. I mean, if you died on the job, nobody really cared. Or if they did, it's like, well, it's so much, it's a mark in a ledger book. You know, like you don't have any rights. And it's not even, even if somebody wanted to confer upon you some kind of voice or wanted to, you know, kind of make your lot in like better just like the velocity of production and the trajectory of things like there was you didn't you didn't matter you know you were you became totally dehumanized you know and that's what the socialists were trying to do they're like we in, in, on the right and the left they're like you know we we've got to like repair this kind of social fabric and this interdependence and this basic basic ethical unity of classes and functions you know so that people aren't being treated like a commodity and so that like when they die in the job you know they're just not like shoveled away like so much garbage like literally you know i mean that's that's the way to keep in mind that's the thing to keep in mind like in america there there wasn't some medieval order from which things originated like even in the south like people i know the southerners themselves kind of looked at themselves as a as a as, as kind of like lords and knights which wasn't totally inaccurate but it was more like but again it was more like athens than it was like uh than it, than it was like you know a 13th century England, you know like you had like the South was basically made up of like kulak types, you know there were white serfs and there were black slaves but they weren't the majority. The majority was not like rich plantation owners and like poor serfs and like and, and slaves who were property. Like the majority was like small freehold farmers who were doing their own thing, and that's that's supposedly the American ideal. Okay, like now it's like a small businessman. I'm not saying that's actually the way things are, but that's like what's idealized. But you know, the in America, if you're on the right, um, your idea isn't like, well, you know, we gotta we gotta bring things back to you know the throne and altar and like reverence for God and God's emissaries on earth, and you know we gotta create some kind of codependence between the classes that's not dysfunctional. Like the ideal is like, you know, I I need. I, I need to be given the opportunity to like till the land and get what's mine and, you know, have the government stay off my bed and not take the fruits of my labor. I mean, a totally different sensibility. Like one's not superior to the other. I mean, obviously I'm more sympathetic to the American model because that's my heritage. And I, you know, and, and then plus that's just like what's realistic. Like you can't, one of the reasons that it's goofy when, I mean, I realize some of this is polemical, but some of these idiots actually believe this. Like when, when like, when like regime loyal people or when these like mother Jones types claim that like Donald Trump's this big fascist or something. I mean, that's like retarded for long as a reason, but like some radical right wing guy, like if George Wallace become president or Huey Long become president, it would not look anything like Germany in 1933. You're like Italy in 1922. Like that's ridiculous. That's not the way we do things here. Like that's like, that's like saying that that's as retarded as saying like, Oh, if Donald Trump had his way, you know, he would, he would, he would, he, you know, he would be, um, like the Holy Roman Emperor. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. 
But I, you know, like I, I made the point before that the entire like civic religion of America is like is anti-fascism, which which is particularly kind of asinine in this country. But yeah. Well, that that set me up perfectly. Um, so we know because you know Gentile Gentile wrote what fascism was in Italy, but as far as I know, there, you know, really nobody in Germany at the time was writing what socialism meant to them. What socialist? You know, you can listen to the Strasser debates and everything, and you can get a, you can get an idea. But in your opinion, what what the national socialism of Germany, what did, what did that socialism actually mean? I mean, they were drawing upon a couple of things. And if you read, there's not a lot you can extrapolate. I love telling people to read Hitler's second book um, because it, it's instructive. It, it, it fleshes out his geostrategic ideas and some other things. And it's just interesting reading. And, you know, it was never published. Like the manuscript was found by the U.S. Army and then it was handed over to... It was handed it was handed to army intelligence. The chain of custody was weird, but it is it has been authenticated. I mean, it, it was it was Hitler's actual manuscript, but it wasn't published and available to the public until after the war. But you know, people there's not like there's not a lot you can extrapolate from Mein Kampf. That's why it's idiotic when people are like, oh, it's a boring book. It's like, well, yeah, it's 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 an election year screed from the 1920s. Like, why why would it be interesting today? But <clears throat> what is interesting? Um, like when he talks about um, when he when when Hiller talks about his 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 ideas on on conflict between human populations, like that's in, that's instructive, and also um, you know I made the point of people before Hitler he was this Catholic Habsburg Austrian who uh, basically identified his movement as the legacy of the Prussian state, and um, you know the the December eleventh speech the Reichstag which is really Hitler's last public address of the Reichstag. You know, that's like when he issued the Declaration of War Against America. Um, he talks about, uh, he talks about we, like the royal we, like in reference to the Prussians and the Napoleonic Wars. Okay, so I mean, he's saying like, and then, then that's notable because like, you know, Prussia was at odds with the rest of the German kingdoms. I mean, that's a little bit off topic, but... Be as it may, like Adolf Hitler himself, if Adolf Hitler is like the standard bearer of like right wing socialism in Weimar, which I mean, I think I think we can say that he was because he's the man who became king proverbially. Um, his view was what I just said. It was that you know the the proper like German the proper German model of of, of national life is is Prussia, and and the Prussian model was based on was based on the army, and um you know, the, the civic apparatus that, that revolved around that. So, I mean, that's the way, that's what you can think of German socialism. Of course, to your point, guys like Strasser, guys like Rahm, uh, Kurt von Schleicher, I think was a lesser aristocrat who was basically cynical and he didn't really care, but he was obviously threw in his lot with, with Strasser and Rahm because he wanted to destroy Hitler. But all these guys, at least what they were advocating in public was they were saying like, you know, Hitler's a tool of the bourgeoisie. Um, he's not really a revolutionary. He's just a reactionary, and he's a petty bourgeois buffoon. Um, so, I mean, the no true Scotsman stuff about socialism, a lot of that was interesting rivalry between national socialists. It's not like the German street was, uh, where, where like 1970s era, like, you know, Berkeley types, you know, talking about like who's a real socialist. It was a lot more. It was a lot less existential and like a lot more like polemical and, and kind of cynical than that. I mean, that's my view. Um, and I think I'm something, if not an expert, I think I have some, I think I have some expertise on the topic at least. I just wanted to take a break and let you know how you can support the show. Head on over to freemanbeyondthewall.com forward slash support. You can see every way, Patreon, my website, which is the best way, subscribe star. Substack. There's even some crypto addresses there. Also, there is my P.O. Box, P.O. Box 832, Auburn, Alabama, 36831. Send me anything you want. I appreciate all of you, and your continued support means the world to me. Thank you very much. I want to get back to Sorel, but I wanted to mention this. Um, so you mentioned that Prussia was based off of the military. Um, a lot of people, a lot of Americans point out that 
you know, Prussian schooling is, you know, um, what's his name? I can't even remember his name now. Um, he went to Prussia, saw, um, saw how the schooling was done and basically yeah. brought it back. Um, and, but what a lot of people will say is that all that schooling is meant to do is turn people into a cog in the machine to be plugged in. So if that is true, it seems like that is creating a group of people in that they're the students. If the students are all learning the same thing, then that could be seen as egalitarian. Yeah. The, well, the difference, too, of course, is, yeah, it's not just that, you know, the Prussian model identifies that, you know, the, the vast difference in human intellect and abilities and kind of organizes people into proverbial slots or organize them based on, you know, how those things can be cultivated and utilized. But also, like, the core of the Prussian ethos is, you know, the, the, the racial community. So if you take that Prussian model, but you utilize it as kind of a way of, of derationing people and saying, okay, you're not like a Mexican, you're not like a white man, you're not, you're not black. You know, you're not you're not Asian. You're you're just a, you're just American. You just have this civic identity where you're not going to speak your own language anymore. You know, you're not going to go to your own church anymore. You're not going to you know you're not going to abide these habits anymore of your forebears. You know, like that's like that's what's really insidious about like the New Deal or like American model. It's not it's not so much that it declares that like every man's going to have some kind of like income in common. Or that it's going to like reduce, you know, like the proverbial disparity, you know, between the ownership cast and what was then the work, working cast. Like what was insidious about it is that it 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 was tailored to essentially like strip people of any ability to live historically and any like meaningful, you know, actual cultural identity. You know, it was going to like alienate man from his heritage and from history in absolute terms. Like that's the big difference, and that's also why. I object a lot. There's something to it when people talk about quote cultural Marxism. If they're talking about Gramsci and Adorno, like contra Marx and Engels, but they don't understand that like a lot of this, a lot of this doesn't have to do with Orthodox Marxism or or, or Frankfurt School stuff at all. A lot of it's like New Dealer bullshit. You know, like race blind, like God is dead. You know, we 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 know now that like everything is reducible to you know data derived from the scientific method. You know, the man's basically just like an animal who can talk and, you know, there's no more history and there's no more culture. All that matters is making man more suitable to governance and eliminating these, you know, these problems like, you know, like, like, like conflict between the races or like men and women not getting along. Like that's like that kind of or, or, a fam or, or a family. I mean, just yeah, read, exactly. the read the authoritarian personality. Yeah, exactly. I mean exactly. So I mean, there's like a pastiche, like definitely like Frank or school stuff. And, and and that kind of thing became preeminent, like in especially like as as the American left broke entirely, not just the American left, but in Europe, like when the left just in, in macro terms like broke with like Stalinism and decided like the East Bloc were their enemy. I mean, this was long in coming, but they were looking around for some kind of for some kind of ideological canon, and they settled on like the Frankfurt School. But this is also what had been turned loose on on on, on, on divided Germany. You know, I mean, so. There was a lot of things, and yeah, uh, this definitely became part of like the American conceptual horizon, like in policy terms as well as academic intellectual terms. But there was a lot of stuff that also like preceded that, you know, like these fools like who were uh, who built like the Department of Education and all that kind of stuff, and and these and these uh, and even 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 a lot of guys who preceded their dealers, like Colonel House, uh, who was uh, you know, Will kind of the Wilson's uh, kind of Machiavelli, you know, administer without portfolio. Like, uh, even, even he was, like, prone to a lot of that kind of nonsense. Like, House wrote that he wrote this really bad science fiction novel where there was, like, this benevolent dictator who was obviously supposed to be himself. And uh, he basically, like, you know, finds a way to, like, strip man of any, like, historical identity. And he, like, forces everybody to speak this, like, Esperanto language. So now there's, like, no more war. And this great man becomes, like, God on Earth because there's no more war. And it's, like, why, why would that be remotely desirable? It sounds like a nightmare. Like, like idiots like Colonel House, like there's some like great utopia that like you know that acquits government of any criticism because you know the most the greatest thing ever is somehow like if black kids have high test scores and like everybody lives in a big prison where war is impossible. Like no one can explain like why these things are so awesome, but like that's their conceit. Let me just uh, 
try to nail down exactly what you meant when I when I mentioned the Prussian schooling. So, oh yeah, in Prussia, if your if your goal is to educate everyone and bring them down into a cohesive culture that works within itself, and that's what the Prussian that's what the Prussian education system meant to do. But Definitely. if you tra- if you transfer that over into the United States, now you're stripping a multicultural society and you're saying everyone has to be one. And obviously some are going to rebel against that and not and the ones who don't rebel against it are going to basically lose what kind of social cohesion they have within their own community. No, exactly. And that's why. One of the things that brought the United States and the Soviet Union together, um, I'm talking, you know, like the the New Deal Stalinist alliance. Like on its face in geostrategic terms, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like I, what Lindbergh said and what Houston Stewart Chamberlain said, they, I mean, yeah, those guys obviously had political and aesthetic preferences for Germany. But in, in raw geostrategic terms, it doesn't really make sense for America and the UK to decide they're going to annihilate Germany in alliance with Russia. Like I, what what makes sense is for you know Europe led by Germany, the UK and the United States, you know, to constitute this kind of ramparts against the East, you know, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, you know, whatever it is. Okay, that's there's, there's a basic illogic to uh to what developed, um, and one of the reasons why that happened was uh ideological necessity, and the United States and the Soviet Union was about the rationality of their objectives. Um, domestically, uh, they, were, they, they, they had similar problems. You know, Stalin's big problem was the nationalities problem. You know, like, how do I strip everybody of their ethnic identity and make them into new Soviet men? And the New Dealers were like, they had the same problem. You know, like, how do you, like, destroy, like, the nationalities in America? You know, and, and I mean, that this still goes on today. Like, that's why, in typical fashion, when the regime talks about, quote, multiculturalism, they're talking about the opposite. They're talking about, like, the eradication of all culture, you know. Um, but that's, there's very few, I mean, then is now, there's not a hell of a lot of states organized like the United States or like the Soviet Union was. Like, it's not it's not a natural political or- mode of organization. So you can do one of two things there. Um, you know, you can either, you, you, you can either, uh, you, you can either rule by way, of, like, kind of evolved federalism. You know, and and basically leave people alone to manage their own affairs within their own cultural spaces. Or, uh, but I mean, government never is willing to do that. I mean, at least here. Um, so they're they're always going to opt for this idea of 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 just you know eradicating culture and, and ripping people out of um out of a historical existence. And um, both that are, I mean, that's one of the things that brought down the Soviet Union. And that's, all, that's also one of the reasons why post-Cold War, like, a, America does not have moral legitimacy. But that was definitely what they wanted to do. And the, um, but there's, this is going to sound like a goofy example, but I'm using it because it pops up again and again in the 60s. I read a lot of science fiction from the era, and science fiction from that era wasn't just entertainment. There was a lot of think tank guys. I mean, even until the, until the 80s, you know, Jerry Pornell, who was, you know, kind of the driver was by SDI, like he wrote science fiction and he was when he, you know, incident to his like think tank and policy work and stuff. But, you know, there was that corny old Star Trek episode where like Captain Kirk and, and Spock, they go down to this planet and it's like the Third Reich. And they don't know how this is possible. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And then they, they and then ultimately it's unraveled like, oh, well, this guy in like the 22nd century he crashed, like, from Earth, he crash lands on this planet, there's these primitive humanoids, but they're always at war. And he's like, okay, well, I, I know I know how to resolve this. So he creates this, like, Third Reich-style regime. And then Kirk, like, addresses the audience, like, you know, this was the most efficient government of all time, but, you know, they, they were they were brutal racists. So, you know, that's why it didn't work. But the idea was in some way noble. And that's that's interesting. And that, comes, that comes up again and again, not just in, like, corny science fiction, but in, like, policy papers, like, we admire the Prussian state because the Germans are a great people, but they're these brutal races. So that's why it didn't work. But we've got to extrapolate that here in some way, but strip it up of these chauvinistic and, and like racialized views and things. Um, people don't think that way directly anymore. It's been finessed in different ways, but that's like what underlies it. Like, especially in a place like Chicago, but nationwide, like the degree to which these institutions people take for granted are like things taken from the Prussian state. It's crazy. 
You know, it it really is. You know, the degree that's not just me. I that, that, that that's not just me. You know, being a like a Teutonophile or something. I, I mean, I'm sure like in part on that too, but it, it just like can't be denied. Like I'm not even saying that's like a, a good or a bad thing. It's just reality. You know. Um, and uh, the people at one time, people were way more kind of like directly cognizant of that, or at least willing to acknowledge it. So I mean, that's important to consider. All right, I wanted to get back to the book. Let me yeah. show everybody. This is yeah. from Imperium Press: Reflections on Violence by Sorrell. And from the forward, um, I'm going to read your words and have you comment on this. It says, okay. "Rather has already been alluded to Sorellian violence." can best be understood as an absolute, uncompromising, and radical commitment to pure history and bloodletting, parentheses, one's own in the case of the martyr and the enemies in the case of the partisan, and bloodletting is the sanctifying process. And you go on to say, A partisan unwilling to die or commit homicide is no more a political soldier or agent of history than would be a lawgiver who is incapable, for reasons of moral or physical frailty, of executing a death warrant issued by order of the king's bench as an agent of exclusive sovereign authority. Sorel viewed the modern bourgeoisie as particularly decadent and harmful, but he did not think the conditions of his epoch to be otherwise unique. All ruling regimes, political and social, develop over time a kind of moral and intellectual apathy that precludes its worthiness, or at least revokes its mandate, to act in a role of guardianship or standard bearer over the subject matter of its dominion. This is not to suggest that Sorel shared a secularized eschatological vision of utopian salvation common to Marxists and progressives, which posited that the condition of man or the state or national community was capable of perfection by way of revolutionary processes. Rather, and and I underline this, he viewed the fervor of violence as a hygienic mechanism entirely congruent, uh, congruous with his own rejection of the linear view of history. Yeah. I mean, that that's the best way. I know it seems verbose, but it's, it's hard to convey these things in, in, in kind of rational terms, but that's, yeah. I mean, that's the best way to think of to describe it. And that's, I mean, that's all the, uh, the degree to which, uh, and I mean, this also, um, this, uh, some of this, um, Sorel was definitely like in, in in direct dialogue with the maestro, but some of this, <clears throat> again, um, is found in in the kind of pre-Socratic hero epics, um, like Sorel, like Sorel saw the the Socratic, uh, what what he views like the decadence of the Socratic uh, era in Athens. He said what you were left with was, you know. Instead of this, instead of this mono class of yeoman farmers, you know, uh, the best of whom you know rose to leadership rank, um, whose whose education consisted of mythology and hero epics, what you had was there developed this class of professional politicians who relied upon the intellectuals like Socrates to rationalize their rule, but neither of whom were capable of real action, and both resented each other, and both were afraid of and hostile to the yeoman warriors. So you're left with this kind of like parallel paralysis where um the the men who should be the ones like most capable of direct action and violence are declare that you know this kind of thing is illegal and immoral because they're terrified of their own position being swept aside uh, and and their own like you know lives being threatened by such a process so there's this kind of like ongoing paralysis where this where the, just kind of like meaningless discourse takes the place of action and yeah like i said in the intro that you just reiterated it's not that Sorrell thought violence was so great or like the sexy thing that we all got to get into. He was saying that, you know, in political terms, you're not serious unless, you know, you're willing to implement your will through violence. And in fact, he took human life and the taking of it very seriously. And that's one of the reasons why um, there's something sacrosanct about the revolutionary process. If you're literally willing to kill people, even if they're your enemies, and maybe especially if they're your enemies, like, that's a very serious thing. You know, it's not something you do flippantly. And it's certainly not something you do over petty disagreements. 
And um, if you're willing to do that, uh, there's a sacred aspect to that um, that commands uh, a certain reverential observance. Uh, I mean, it's, it's all of those things, but that's also why um, that's also, and until things reach that state, whether it's because, um, you know, the, the, like the, the extant system is failing structurally at such a point that people find themselves in these just dire circumstances where their survival's in jeopardy. Um, or when you're talking about, um, you know, uh, a revolutionary circumstance incident to, you know, uh, uh, a wider kind of strategic pairing of warfare. Um, you know, the, what, what necessitates these things is, is is a convergence of extreme conditions and and the human will and the hardening of the human heart within that will. So like when people in America, like at present, I mean, like like talk about it, like oh Donald Trump is an extremist or oh you know we're we're under siege by 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 quote Marxists. You'll know you'll know when that's underway, man, because there's bodies being dropped, and thankfully that's not happening because in the American's condition. And in the, in the uh, under present conditions, I don't, I don't think that would lead to anything positive, frankly. Okay, um, I just don't. That may change, but for now, it would, it would, it would, it would mean a lot of suffering and a lot of, a lot of dead people being stacked up for no real purpose. But um, yeah, that's um, that's also, and also, like, I, I don't want to get too far afield, but this is intrinsic to anything that European um, political theorists wrote about really until the 20th century, this idea, this kind of Rawlsy and li- capital liberal idea that people have in America, kind of like on all sides of the political, or both sides of the political spectrum, of like, oh, politics is just this rational process that people decided to create and implement. Like, no Europeans thought that way. Politics is mysterious. And like the zenith of political um, occurrences is, is warfare. And, you know, politics, like warfare itself, is its origin is mysterious. We don't really know why things are ordered this way, you know. Even if you don't believe in God, there's there's some kind of there there, there there's some kind of design. Even 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 if it's just man acting out, you know, is 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 programming like as as an as an, an ant colony would. That's very mysterious and strange. We don't know why that happens, you know. So all you can really do is you're, you're truly like in quite literal terms like riding the proverbial tiger to try and manage, um, you know political occurrences and and violence therein chooses us. We don't really choose it. So um, there's an inherent uh, kind of providential, uh, there's an inherent identification of providential things and phenomenon within the European mind um, conceptually. So that, that, that's important to keep in mind. Like this really jumps out at me, I think, because um, I mean, I'm very much like a God-centric person. I'm a Bible Protestant, but um, I'm like an old stock American, so like I'm, I'm inundated with, uh, with, uh, with, with kind of like American viewpoints and things, you know, when I always was. Even guys like Russell Kirk, you know, who was a Catholic, um, but he, he was kind of the quintessential like American, like 20th century political historian. Like even he like falls into this kind of trap of, of kind of like Rawlsian and, and, and Hobbesian ontology about man kind of like rationally choosing to like organize politics this way. And that's nonsense. Um, and that maybe that's a topic for another episode, but yeah. Yeah. I like that you mentioned how Europeans view politics uh, versus Americans, especially back then, because, and then earlier you had mentioned how, you know, people read Spengler and he seemed, it seems esoteric because I recommended um, Imperium to somebody and they started reading it and they're like, this, it, does it stay this esoteric? And then that's when you realize it's like, well, politics isn't one thing. We've been, <laughs> we've been convinced, we've been taught in this country that politics is just one thing or it's, it's, it's this side against this side. And no, politics has a very spiritual side to it. And that's why I think a lot of people, especially people who are biblical, when they read Imperium and they read part one, they're completely blown away because they've never read politics like that before. That's a good point. Yeah. And Imperium's a really well-written book. It's not just because I like Francis Yaki a lot. I mean, even before I even like knew anything about Francis Yaki, like his book would always pop up on IHR, uh, you know, IHR newsletters and <clears throat> Willis Cardo obviously would always plug it 
Um, and I got it. There's a, there was a used bookstore in Evanston and like Noontide Press at that time, um, uh, which was Willis Cardo's outfit. Like they weren't currently stocking it. So this was like in 1997 or so. Like I, I, I just, I just, I just used bookstore in Evanston and like order me like an old hard copy of Imperium. You know, and I like took it home and read it. And uh, I, I, I was like, wow, this is really intense stuff and it's really insightful. So, I mean, I, I came to Yaki by reading his book and realizing like, this is this is a this is incredibly, you know, highly developed and serious stuff, um, and yeah, it's a, it's just really well written. Um, some of Yagi's language at the time seems overwrought because uh, you know he was a he was he was he was he was a he was a litigation attorney, and I mean that kind of comes out, but uh, that's all that's also as part of like the time though, like in the early like really until like the nineteen fifties, that's just kind of like the way people wrote, even kind of square people, just like you know, writing on behalf of some kind of, like, even somebody, like, writing, like, uh, like, an op-ed on behalf of, like, Eisenhower in, like, the early 50s, like, what it, it, might, it would seem kind of, like, overwrought to us, probably, like, but it, uh, the language, I mean, but, but, yeah, that's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a serious book, like, whether you, you know, even if you, even if you're basically kind of hostile to fascism or, you know, post-fascist ideas, and even if you're not, you know, any kind of, any kind of Germanophile. I mean, you can't like like the people claim like oh, Imperium's like mystical garbage. Like none of them have actually read the book. I know it's like I've engaged them. Like, well, what do you object to specifically? Like they can't tell you. They're just like repeating. They're just, like repeating some nonsense they like read online, or they're just you know, it, it's just like some conceit they have. That I guarantee you, they have not actually read it. I um, not because I'm so great, but because I'm like a, a bookworm. I've actually read like. I, 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 I've, I've read Marx and Engels for 20 years. Like when I, I don't like sound off about a body of political theory that I haven't read. And you'll notice like when you're raising that I haven't read it, I tell you straight up, like I haven't read that. But I don't, most people, <clears throat> most people don't sit around like, you know, um, reading Das Kapital. Most people don't sit down and read like all 600 pages of Imperium. They just don't. Um <laughs> Owing to the fact that everybody's got to live their life doing what they got to do. I'm lucky I have the time to like read this kind of shit. But it's also, I mean, people, I don't think people have the attention span anymore. Like even smart guys. Like I, one of the things I learned to do in law school, if, if I derived anything of value from that experience is like, I can sit down for like nine hours and like power through like pages and pages and pages of dense text. Um, there's things I'd much rather do than that, but I can do it. And like, it do not you know, it doesn't like, it's not like torture to me. So yeah. A part of the forward is under the title Modernist Violence in Service of Ancient Virtues. And something that I, um, a couple sections I'm going to pick out here. Uh, he viewed the organization, management, and economics of the homestead and the cultural values intrinsic to this enterprise as being inextricably linked to and mutually reinforcing of military competence and endeavors and the waging of war itself. Um, going moving down, um, he further views the yeoman homestead as a school of command. A man must rule his wife and children firmly, but also caringly and justly. He must also demonstrate his worthiness to wield his authority. A man's wife and children are obliged to obey his commands, but only insofar as his commands command role is tempered by correct virtues and practical reason. Um, do you think that is why the founding of this country, like? actually worked in yeah, the definitely. beginning in the beginning yeah, yeah. and it, like i said it calls back to um if you read uh if if you read what these confederate like men of letters were writing about i mean that that's what they that was their mythology they were calling upon they, they were they were calling upon athens okay i mean late, later you know you read everything from walker percy to uh to michael shara you know guy with the killer angels you know, they, they, they invoke like our theory and legend and stuff. But I mean, really the way the Southerners thought of themselves, it was like that, you know, and, um, and that's why like, you know, in terms of like place names, and everything else, you know, like Athenian references, you know, were ubiquitous in the antebellum self. And to some degree, like still are in the South. Um, and yeah, that's the way they viewed it. Because again, the, the South was not, the South was not the Habsburg empire. It was, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a yeomanry, uh, who viewed themselves as kind of like a monocast. You know, like, that's why, and I mean, part of that was possible because, like, uh, slavery was racialized. You know, like, the, 
but it was so. I mean, you you, you dated so many times a mono cast, like even even like a poor even like a poor like white like tenant farmer and like a lord of the manor, like they had some kind of political interest in common, like kind of for the slaves. Now I know that like I, I know people like Howard Zinn would be like, oh, well, that's because they were just educated in you know racial prejudice. Like that's not the case. Like there are people do obviously identify in communitarian terms like along racial and cultural lines and that's only possible um it, that, that, and then that's really only possible if there is like an us and them like paradigm that's not good or bad it's just the way it is and yeah that's if you um in the north it was a little bit different um but at the same time too like i said even you know the uh the the old right, what was called old right in the twentieth century, you know, America First and and Robert Taft and stuff. That was, those those guys were those guys were Hamiltonian Republicans. They were like northern city slickers. But at the same time, you know, they they viewed uh they viewed kind of the American ideal, you know, as like the small businessman, like our version of the Kulak, you know, like they so that I, I maintain that's not just a Confederate conceit. That is truly like the old American ethos. And yeah, it's got no, it's got nothing, uh, you know, there is no Caesar in that equation. Okay. So it's, you know, it's not, there's no Caesar and there's not even a King Arthur, you know, there's, uh, the, the ideal, like, like the American hero, he's an archetype. He's not, he's not a king or he's not like a man in a certain, in a certain official role. So yeah, I think, I think that's fundamentally important. And I admit, I mean, that's the way I think, like not even consciously, like I, you know, that's why I think some of these like trad guys on the internet are weirdos. Like I'm not talking about like like actual like Russian guys, or I'm not talking about um, you know, some of these uh some of these Muslim guys who who abide that worldview too. I'm talking about like guys from, like Terry Hood, Indiana, who like decide that they're like trad Catholics or something. It's like, bro, like what well, you want you want like you you wanna you wanna you wanna you wanna you wanna pretend it's you know, we got a king here or something, or you wanna pretend you're in the court of Caesar. Like why the fuck would you wanna do that? And plus, I mean, it's not like our heritage anyway, you know, like that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't work. Um, yeah. Yeah. People hate to hear this, but I mean, we're a Protestant country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, I, mean no, I, I agree with you, Michael Jones. He's like, if you are like, you know, culturally Catholic, I mean, it, it, Jones is right. Like America, it wasn't as a massively anti-Catholic country. And I don't think that's a good thing because uh, they're not a bigot. Um, but that this idea you can like sort of reconcile Americanism with Roman Catholicism and just make the Pope some kind of like first deacon or some kind of like, you know, or some kind of like equivalent of, uh, of Billy Graham like that. That's ridiculous. Like that, that's, that's not Catholicism then, you know, you're just like some guy who like, who like goes to mass occasionally and, you know, uh, on Christmas Eve at midnight, you know, goes to like his local parish, but that Catholicism has actual implications for politics and authority. And like the Pope is either the, the Pope's either the emperor of Europe in absolute terms, or he's not, you know, I mean, and he's, he's not, he's not Billy Graham. He's not this, he's not this deacon in a weird hat who like, we all kind of listen to when we want to, you know, like he, he is either God's emissary on earth or he's not, you know, ain't my fight. I'm not a Catholic, but if you are, you can't, you can't be a Catholic and then decide that like, you're going to like pretend Joe Biden is the president, you know, like, and... <laughs> yeah. I wanted to I wanted to read this one section under anti modern modernism. Um, it says uh, Sorel shared with Pradon and Hobbes a pessimistic view of nature. This is one facet of Sorelian thought that fundamentally alters the way in which Sorel's relationship to socialism is to be understood. Sorel viewed man as basically mired in sin and driven by his own avarice and egoism and desire for his own gain. This tendency in the Sorelian view, and this is the part I underlined, is only overcome by submission to sovereign authority, customary as well as formal, in ordinary conditions, and when necessary, by immersion in collectively dynamic and violent efforts, often themselves both revolutionary and restorative in character. Yeah. Sorrell's, yeah, Sorrell's commitment to socialism must be understood within this context. 
that socialism, for better or worse, was considered a historic inevitability in structural terms, and if nothing else, it was at least grudgingly stipulated, even by many of its staunchest critics on the European right, that at least some concessions to the popular demands of socialist parties would need to be made for any future government to enjoy the legitimacy it required to effectively rule. Yeah. And that's why, and that's all, and that explains the ascendancy of, 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 of the NSDAP and Adolf Hitler. I mean, Hitler was always more popular than the party, but eventually, you know, Hindenburg, uh, Hindenburg personally disliked Hitler. And I think him, I think Hindenburg personally disliked the National Socialists. But, you know, again, it was, the Stahlhelm wasn't going anywhere for that, for that reason that, uh, Sorrell outlined and that I just kind of like explicated in plain English. The, uh, you know, this, there's, um, I, I realize that, you know, in, from the 20th century onward, especially with the advent of visual media, as well as, you know, the concentration of power, um, in, in key loci and the ability of, of consolidated governments to, you know, to kind of dictate policy, you know, they, there's, there's a power to kind of create a conceptual horizon, you know, like the media, like in the, in the Oliver Stone movie, natural born killers you know like woody harrelson says he says the reporter like media is like weather but it's man-made weather like that that's actually really poignant okay and like i stipulate that that's very true at the same time you can't just generate some kind of like revolutionary tendency out of the air or, or and you can't just quash one that's emergent so this idea that you know i mean i, I think adolf hitler believed everything he said for better or worse whether you think hitler was great or whether you think he was evil like he wasn't a liar and he wasn't, he wasn't a politician in the conventional sense. Like he believed everything he said. Um, he didn't take on like a socialist program. Um, like, like Thalman claimed and the KVD claim, you know, just for cynical reasons, like he believed in it. But like, even if you didn't like, yeah, it was, the reality was that he may um, be wrong, but he never lied. Yeah. And the, and the Weimar voter, the Weimar voter had a socialist sensibility. Like you could say that that was bad or that you didn't accept that. It's like, well, okay, but then you're not in the game, you know? So there's no, there's no way any kind of like reactionary party or, or some kind of like Kaiserreich revanchist party, like what would, would have gone anywhere in Germany. Like it just wouldn't have, you know? And, um, and like I said, that wasn't just, that was, that wasn't just like the fervor of like, you know, the kind of red wave after 1921, 22, it was it, that was like deeply insinuated into like the German consciousness, you know, like the uh, this idea, you know, like like we talked about at the at the, at the top of the hour, like the the um, you know, uh, socialism as we know it essentially, you know, came from came from Prussia and and came from uh, that this, that state of organization, which itself was derived from this desire uh, and this fundamental imperative to kind of repair the social fabric that had ceased to exist after, you know, the medieval era um, disappeared into, into historical time. I got to raise up in a minute though. So if, if let's, um, we can, we can do okay. a part two on this if you want. Sure. Um, sure. But right. yeah, I, yeah. If there's anything else you want to hit just real quick though, in terms of key points, uh, let's take those up now. Okay. Let's just do one, one last question. Yeah, man. Do you think America has ever had a right wing? And if they did, when did it disappear? Do they have a right wing now? Yeah, I'm going to deal with the first part of the question first. The war between the states, there was there was something of a, there was not a conventionally right-left paradigm to that, but it was the precursor of it, okay? I mean, there was guys in the North who were, uh, who who were kind of nullifiers who didn't really want to you know and the free who were the free soilers who didn't really want a part of the war between the states but they were highly racially conscious and highly anti-government um but if you're talking about the actual partisans you know like the kind of like kind of the the true like rebels in the south and uh and you're talking about the fire eaters in the north you like and and the um the like the radical abolitionists like there was that was something of a precursor to like right left divide in America. It's an imperfect analogy, but there's that. Later, um, I agree with basically what Pat Buchanan was, wrote in the 80s and 90s about the old right uh, being, um, you know, the, the Hamiltonian, uh, Robert Taft right, the America first right. That was, that, 
that was the emergent American right in modern terms. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the 20th century, the war between the states wasn't ancient history. It was less than a hundred years in the past. Okay. So, I mean, the, like America as like a consolidated, uh, national union was, was a pretty new thing. So there's that too. The, um, I believe, uh, I, I'm always making the point that, you know, the Nuremberg system replacing the Westphalian system that had not just profound implications for international order and war and peace and and and, and the conceptual horizon of of, uh, of of heads of state, but it also uh, it made it, it made the political right quite literally illegal because that, that that was part that was that was half of the reason for holding the Nuremberg proceedings in the first place is to say that, you know, Okay, like you know, the Allies were on the side of of Providence and history, and opposition to that, which is the right wing, you know, this is a criminal conspiracy of racist murders, you know, and 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 obviously, you know, no no rational actors such as you know the Marxist Leninists in Moscow and the New Dealers in Washington would ever start a war. So wars were only started, you know, by the intrigues and cons and conspiracies of, of of brigands and criminals and racists, and that's what the right wing is. You know, so we're, it's it's just illegal to hold these views because they result in genocide and warfare. Um, that's why after that's why there was no like Huey Long or Robert Taft um, after 1949 or 48, 49. OK, like uh, you the closest thing was a guy like Joe McCarthy. But obviously, you know, there were, there were the uh, the deep state closed ranks to to wipe him out. Like I'm not saying McCarthy was like a great guy. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying morally. I mean, I don't think he was. I think he was kind of a bumpkin. I don't think he was a great figurehead, and I've got my own issues with him. But and certainly, his association with Roy Cohn didn't do him any favors. But um, <laughs> but the for all kinds of reasons. But we'll, we'll get into that in our Cold War series. But the um, but that was that was basically the American right as it was as it was ossifying. You know, Huey Long, Robert Taft, um, Wallace was a resurgence of that. You know, and um, and of course Nixon took on the Wallace Coalition, which became the Reagan Coalition, which became MEGA. Um, that's right wing in the American sense. I mean, I I think it's somewhat of a protest movement, but at the if those people had better leadership, and if they had uh, and if they had a stronger intellectual foundation, um, I think they'd very much like identify with Taftian principles, like actual America First principles. So yeah, I mean, I think I I think that's basically genuine. Um, I I think there's a lot of silly stuff like within. Uh, I, I mean, if we can still consider like MAGA to be a movement, like the, you know, the I was on the ground on January six. I mean, I'm not saying that to sound like I mean, it, like speaking of the natural born killer, I'm not trying to come off like Robert Downey Jr.'s character to say you know like I was there when the shit went down in Grenada. I was there. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to come off like that, but. Like I, I raise that a lot because like people say all kinds of crazy stuff about January sixth, and like when I tell them like they're wrong, and they're like, "Well, how do you know?" It's like, "Well, because I was there, fucker." Like I, that's how. But um, and and I those people were gutsy. I think a lot of them for like turning out in depth, you know, to exhibit their discontent, which was entirely well placed. But it was also just like a lot of like fucking real goofs, man, and like guys doing dumb shit, you know, like like that freaking weirdo like who painted himself up like braveheart like running around like acting like an idiot like i saw a lot of like that kind of shit and there's like goofy stuff like that that you know like on the mega right um so i mean there's like more than like a seed of potential and they are in some real way like the heirs to like you know the taft hamiltonian um and later like the you know the wallace nixon reagan uh coalition but it's problematic because like America is problematic in terms of how politics breaks down. I mean, that's my view of it. I'm sure yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying bad. I'm not trashing mega people. I, I mean, most of my friends are, are constitute are people like that. You know, I'm not, I'm not some snob. I mean, how can I be? But, um, so I don't want people to think I'm like saying mean things about them, but, um, but yeah, uh, that's my view. And, and at a glance. I know, I know you need to get out of here, uh, do plugs real quick and we'll do that. Yeah. Thank you, Pete. Um, yep. You can find me on Twitter at Triskelion Jihad. Uh, the T is a number seven. But if, if I think if you search for Thomas 777, I come up. Um, 
I, I got kicked off at T-Gram for criticizing uh, Mr. Zelensky, which is interesting. On T-Gram, there's guys who literally post, like, really gross, like, pornography and, like, pictures of dead people. Like, really awful stuff. I, mean, I don't want to sound like some fucking shrinking violet, but, I, I mean, I find that kind of stuff upsetting, you know? And, like, I, but, so that's okay, but, like, if you trash, like, Zelensky, like, you get, like, nuked. So, I mean, hey, I, it, it's, it's neither here nor there. We don't need T-Gram anymore because... The censorship regime has is, 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 is been broken in some way, like enough that at least that we can get our message out. But so I'm not on Telegram anymore. Um, but on my Substack, it's real time at 777.substack.com. There's a chat in there. And if you're a subscriber, like you don't need to pay, but you do need to subscribe to access the chat. And like that's like where we've been congregating. And you can always like hit me up on email if you want to talk to me direct. It, it might take me a week or two to reply. So, just because I get a lot of email. Um, it's Zartax, Z A R T A X 777 at protonmail.com. And um, yeah, that's that's all I got. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks a lot, man. No, likewise, man. This was great. Thank you.